be seated. Enjoy the choir for a moment. Amen. And get ready to give your offering. Amen. Yeah, how many know God's more than enough? Hallelujah. Come on. Yeah. All right, here we go. Yeah. My God is more than enough. He can supply all my needs. He is my El Shaddai. He always works out for me. Jehovah Jireh. Yeah, let me say it yeah, one more time. You're holding my breath. He is my God. Yeah, come on, sing it with me. My God is more than enough. He can supply all my needs. He is my Lord and God. He always looks out for me. Jehovah Jireh. Help me sing it one more time, Jehovah God. He is my God. All right, all of the earth is His, all of the earth is His, and the fullness thereof. Everything that I need, He can be surrounded. Jehovah God.
Come on, let's pray. Get ready to bring the box up to the front. I want to make an announcement in a moment. I'll make it Sunday, but I want to make it to you on Wednesday night also. Everyone lift your hands for this offering. Father, I thank you for this offering tonight. I pray that all the people in this room, Lord, will move to a higher level of success than they've ever had before. God, I thank you for my church. I thank you for the ones that are faithful all the time, God. And God, I desire that the, my people and the other people that are here tonight would really be blessed, God. I pray it in Jesus' name. We love you, Lord. We thank you so much. Amen. Remain standing just for a moment. Here comes the box. Now, this box is our, our Joe Bash box, and we're taking up some offerings to do remodeling in the church. But Sunday, we took up a special offerings for our foundation that's having to get uh, taken care of very soon. And we raise money. And people come and drop into this box and they take care of the house of the Lord. Amen. So Sunday morning, I want you to give a great big shout. We raise, ready? $76,000. All right. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I think you should do one more shout or something. I, mean, I feel pretty good about this. Now, so give a good offering in this box tonight because there are going to be other expenses, okay? Amen. So come and give in the name of Jesus in this box for the glory of God. Come on. Day of victory for me. Welcome Peter Daniels as he comes to minister to us. Come, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be with you. Please be seated. As a backdrop to what I want to share with you this evening, I want to read something from 1 Corinthians 9, starting at verse 19. It's written by my hero, Paul the Apostle. This little whip of a man that stood about five feet tall and was the builder of the early church. And he says these words, that though I am free from all men, I have made myself servant to all that I might win the more. And so to the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without law 
not being without law towards God, but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without law. Or to the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty, Thus I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. I believe those words. I believe they're as valid tonight as the day they were written just so many years ago. And let me say that it's very unusual for me to come back to a church again. I never come back. Even General MacArthur, it took him three years. But I almost never come back to a church. Your pastor is very persuasive. And I said to him, well, they've heard me once. He said, you have no idea how many new people are here. There's been major changes over this period. I said, what should I share? He said, tell them everything. <laughs> so I should give you maybe a little background. I'm 70 years of age. My wife and I, in November this year, will celebrate our 50 years of marriage to each other. We have three children and eight grandchildren who think I'm the fourth member of the Trinity. As a matter of fact, my youngest grandson, Isaac, sang a song before I left home and he asked me to bring it to you. And it went like this. If you're black or if you're white or if you're in between, God loves you. If you're tall or if you're short, or if you're fat or lean, God loves you. He loves you when you're happy. He loves you when you're sad. He loves you when you're very good and even when you're bad. No matter what you look like, no matter what you do, God loves you a hallelujah. God loves you a soccer too. You tell them, Bobby, you tell them. I've never gone through formal schooling. I've never had the disadvantage of going to university. As a matter of fact, at 26 years of age, I was an illiterate bricklayer and stonemason. Well, I went to school as a normal child goes to school, but I was late in going to school. I was suffering from the debilitating de disease called diphtheria, and I was skinny and weak, and they tried to do some educational assessment on me and they said, well, this kid, he's just one brick short of a load. He's not playing with a full deck. His elevator doesn't go to the top floor. And they thought I had brain damage, and they were going to put me in a group of children with brain damage called an opportunity class. Until along came a teacher called Miss Phillips. She would make the rock of Gibraltar look like a marshmallow. I mean, she could kickstart a jumbo jet with a left leg and a shoe off. She said, he's not brain damaged, he's just plain stupid. And for three years she punched me, she kicked me, she slapped me, she didn't get any sense into me or out of me, and she used to get me by the chin and rap my teeth and say, Peter Daniels, you're a bad, bad boy and you're never, ever going to amount to anything. That became a self-fulfilling prophecy. I had four fathers and two mothers most of my relatives had free board and lodgings with King George VI. That meant they were in jail. <laughs> my ambition as a young man was to be flyweight boxing champion of the world. I'd had a fight on every street corner. 
But on May the 25th, 1959, I went along to a Billy Graham crusade in Adelaide, South Australia, where I live. And when I heard the gospel in clear terms for the first time, I suddenly realized I was equal with all men before God, and I reasoned that if I was equal with all men before God, I no need to accept inequality with anyone. I was the son of a king. And I wish you could know the difference that that makes. Oh, I suddenly didn't become intellectually brilliant. But I knew that I knew that something had happened and someone got hold of the book of Joel and read these words, I will restore unto you the years the locust has eaten. And I wanted that restoration. But what do you do when God gives you a dream so big you, you cannot comprehend it? What do you do when you come from the other side of the tracks? What do you do when God gives you a dream, a simple dream, to see how much money one human being can give away in their lifetime from poverty? I'm not talking about ordinary poverty. I'm talking about reaching up to touch bottom. I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have any sponsor. I didn't even know anyone that had gone to high school. So what I did is a true story. As a matter of fact, I've just completed my biography called Living on the Edge. If you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much room. <laughs> and I went down to a, a, a store and I purchased three dictionaries. It's a true story. And I put one next to my bed. I put one in the toilet. That's a good place to read. And I put one in my excuse for a motor car. Now, I need to tell you about this motor car. It was a 1937 Ford V8 Clubman sedan that had been rolled three times. The, the hood was crushed in. The windows were broken. We kept the doors on with wire. It wasn't the gasoline that bothered me. It was how much oil this confounded thing used. If I drove it very carefully, I could get 14 miles to the gallon of oil. And if anyone showed any disrespect for my motor car, I would get on the highway and I would stop the traffic. And I'd wait till they backed up. And then I'd put my foot on the clutch and I'd slap it on the accelerator and I would baptize them in oil. <laughs> I went through the dictionary pointing to words and got other people to correct me and tell me what they meant. And then I'd check other people to make sure the first one told me the truth. I went through those dictionaries, fumbled them, and then backwards until I understood every single word. Then I read 2,000 biographies. Now, I haven't got polygrip. I said 2,000. I then studied law, accountancy, philosophy, theology, modern ancient history, politics, and economics. I found the mind was like a muscle, and it could be developed. And then I went into business. Lost everything. That'll clear your sinuses. <laughs> I paid it back and went into business a second time. Lost it again? I mean, you learn nothing new from the second kick from a horse. I paid it back and was going into business the third time. My wife said to me, Peter, just get a job. <laughs> she said, have some regular income coming in. She said, Peter Jr. needs some shoes for school and, and Graham needs a sweater and I'm pregnant again and you've spent all this money on books. I don't see anything happening. On our 33rd wedding anniversary, I bought her a necklace. It was, uh, at, uh, it was a 49 carat opal with 33 diamonds. I mean, this thing's so big, when she walks, she's got to walk like this. <laughs> I've had you haven't complained about the books I bought lately. <laughs> well, I went into business a third time and lost it again. What do you do when your dreams start to fade? You reach for one more dream. You should never give up, let up, or shut up until God takes you up. Well, I lost it again. Third time. Paid it back and then built one of the largest real estate companies of its kind in our nation with offices in Singapore and Hong Kong. I sold those out some years ago. We're involved in business around the entire world. I do about 100 flights a year somewhere around the world. We own the only privately owned bullion bank in the entire world. We're the only company in the world that has a privately owned currency for the entire world. Two companies paid me a million dollars for advice. One was for 10 minutes. They made 120 million. I'm your wake-up call. It's time Christians got up their blessed assurance.
time for us to win again. It's time for us to take back the economics. I've said to my wife, if anything happens to this brain that can, uh, can do a best-selling book in 15 hours, all longhand, without no reference material and no correction, it's usually worth five million when I finish. I can create these concepts for business that tend to work 100% of the time. I said, if anything happens to this brain, and they're perfected brain implants, for goodness sake, get me a Christian brain. She said, why? I said, because it's never been used. <laughs> well, what do you do? You borrow a book. I've never seen anything happen with a borrowed book. You think somehow that manna's going to come down from heaven. It doesn't work that way. Read the life of Abraham. As a matter of fact, when the Ark of the Covenant came back to the people of God, it didn't come back to the priest, it didn't come back to the religious leaders, it didn't come back to the prophets, it came back to Abinadab. He and his son looked after it for 20 years. We've researched Abinadab through our research team. He was a famous entrepreneur. Some years ago, I financed some of the greatest theologians of our time with one question. What was the value of the gold, frankincense and myrrh that was given to Jesus at his birth in today's currency? Have you ever thought about that? It took them two years to do the investigation. They went down through Persia. They found that they, that they just didn't come down with a few camels. They had an army to protect the treasure. Part of the army was 1,000 bowmen. They came to the city of Herod. And you're reading your Bible that they... Uh, Herod was trouble. Why? Because historically we found that exactly at that time his army was away fighting a war and they could have laid siege to the city and taken it. They arrived at Jesus' home when he was 22 months old and laid it at his feet, unrolled all the, all the carpets and, and some of it was from Solomon's temple. Have you any idea of the value? Try 400 million American dollars. We've got to get away from this poverty mentality. And I'm not part of the wealth cult. I need to emphasize that. You give because God is God. Luke 6.38 does work. Given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. As you give it out to others, so it will be given unto you. But let me tell you, my wife and I tithed and gifts and offerings to 12 long years. We were poorer at the end than what we were at the beginning. But God rewards faithfulness. God rewards faithfulness. Some of you want it like instant coffee. You know, you, want, you, you give this week and you, you want your bills paid by the end of the week. Grow up. Well, God has blessed us. As a matter of fact, next year, 2003, we will be embarking on one of the most daring and impacting journeys of faith and endurance in the history of the Christian church. We're going to put into business over the next 20 years one and a half million Christians in the freehold businesses of their choice. And we're going to bring into the local church. It's time we got back to the authority of the local church. We're going to bring in through the local church over two hundred billion dollars for evangelism. Now let me say this, no one should underestimate the struggle and the unseen enemies that would seek to stop us. I can offer you principles, direction and ultimate victory. I cannot offer you any guarantee of comfort, ease, fair weather or immediate success. But I can say with some certainty the results of those who endure and who are prepared to bear the pain and the anguish of the struggle, that this may be the only opportunity in the history of world events when timing, technology, opportunity and plans are in close harmony together. Some of you may be casualties in the conflict and find the going more than you can bear. Others may give up at the first clear view of the road ahead. But for those who finish the course, complete the journey and obtain the victor's crown, you will be able to pass down a heritage not only to your own family but also the whole human family. And it will be written 
in the pages of history that an army passed through the ends of time without shields, without spears, without cannons, but with rather a unique armory that carried as its banner one single word, hope, and held it high to a lost and a misguided world that needed a change that was wrought by a modern day mul multitude represent what we're calling it the Gabriel call of old, sounding the trumpet with the words, good news, and with God's help, we shall prevail. It's going to happen. You see, what are you doing it for? Well, God gave me another dream as a young man to change the world for 300 years. 26-year-old illiterate bricklayer from a third generation welfare recipient family whose mother tried to abort him to get him out the way. You say that's a crazy comment to make. How can one person change the world in their lifetime? Or let me hasten to remind you in biblical times, Abraham changed the world in his lifetime. Moses changed the world in his lifetime. David changed the world in his lifetime. Gideon changed the world in his lifetime. In more modern times, a man called Mahatma Gandhi with what he called Satyagraha, which was soul force. He broke the chain of colonial power. He changed the world in his lifetime. Henry Ford changed the world in his lifetime when he set the world moving by the automobile. And Roger Bannister changed the world in his lifetime when he ran the first four-minute mile and he proved that the efforts of human endeavor are yet to come. Sir Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill. The last great English bulldog. This man that mobilized the English language and sent it into battle. During the Battle of Britain when he sent those young men up in those spitfire planes that caused him to say, never before in the field of human conflict. As so many are owed, so much to so few. So let us brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth would last for a thousand years, men would still say this. This was their finest hour. He changed the world in his lifetime. Bach and Beethoven changed the world in their lifetime as they expanded our consciousness in the area of symphony and song. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he changed the world when there on Capitol Hill, before the television audience of the world, when he gave that famous speech that said, I have a dream. He said, I have a dream that my four little children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of the character. I have a dream today. And so we have traveled 36 hours to ask you a very simple question. I hope it haunts you for the rest of your life. And it's the question that Joseph Father asked his son when he said, my son, what is this dream that you have? What is this dream that you have? For many of you, it was alive and well when you were a little younger. You'd go for a swim at the lake or the beach and lay in the warm sand. You'd stand in front of a wood fire on a cold winter's night or under the starry heavens of a hot summer night and you would do what men and women in all ages have done. You would contrast that picture of what you are against what you would like to become. What we're going to try and do over the next 48 hours is to turn back on that dream machine. Because growth, success, depend upon three very simple factors. First of all, the climate of the times in which we live. And we live in the most exciting time in the history of the human race. As I walk up and down in my international headquarters with 6,000 years of history, I cannot think of a time I would sooner be alive. This is the most exciting time in history. The Berlin Wall has gone. Uh, communism is finished. We've seen what's happened with September 11. They still couldn't stop you. And let me tell you, while I'm here as an Australian, it was Australia that was the first one that offered America at September the 11th uh, hospitals and and firefighters, and we were the first ones in Iraq, not England, Australia. <laughs> the climate of the time in which we live, you know, the Asiatic world, world has a double word for the meaning of crisis, it's danger and opportunity. Secondly, what you personally are prepared to do as a service to others. Listen, it's about time, Christians, that you own the corporations. You're suffering in an amorphous glob of sameness. 
I mean, when are you going to wake up that you are the light of the world? Not them. You are the light of the world. I mean, you come to the table of maintenance seekers and leave that table hungry. When are you going to realize that God wants you to prosper? When are you going to wake up to the fact that you act as a, a slave for 30 or 40 years by someone telling you what to do? You, not they. You are the light of the world. I had an awful, awful dream last time I was in America about eight or ten weeks ago. I had the most dreadful nightmare I've ever had in my life. I was working for someone. I couldn't believe that, I, that it would even come into my imagination. What you personally are prepared to do is a service to others. And thirdly, what you personally are willing to sacrifice along the way. And remember, two out of those three statements depend on you. Success is not a demand on life. It is a vigorous response to life. And entrepreneurs are the lifeblood of a country. And it's not through government, but entrepreneurship that a nation grows and flourishes. You see, if you are a success, then this nation succeeds. And if the entrepreneurial spirit falters or is stifled, then that which makes any nation great is nullified and void. But because of the speed of travel and the explosion of information, and the instancy of communication, isolation for this or any other country is no longer possible. We are forced to shadow adolescence and assume the role of adulthood and face the future in this, the 21st century, as economically rich by world standards, not only because of our resources in primary production and minerals, but also because of our often forgotten human potential that, if stimulated, could rewrite the economic history books here in the West and towards the third world nations. You see, the world is changing. I, 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 last time I was here in Dallas, a pastor said to me, he said, how do you make money? You know, in all these years, I've never had a pastor just come out and say it like that. How do you make money? You make it out of negotiating. Let me give you a negotiating key. I had something to negotiate recently. The best I could get was $25 each. So I need a million of them. I was able to get it down to $8.30. Every dollar you save, you make another million dollars. People say, well, how, how do you negotiate? How are you able to do this? Well, recently I had to get something done that was $100,000. That was the lowest quote I got. So I phoned the gentleman and I said, I got your quote. He said, I get the job. I said, that's what I'm phoning you about. He said, well, I get it. I said, well, how would you feel if I told you I was able to get it done for $90,000? If I could find someone to do it at $90,000, how would you feel? Well, he said, I really wanted the job. He said, do you mean if I do it at 90000 I can have it? I said, you sure can. He said, I'll come around tomorrow morning. I said, I'll have a contract for you. I'll sign an irrevocable contract immediately. Payment in 30 days. He was there the next morning at 10 a.m. And while he was there, I had $80,000 on the counter in cash. The contract was there waiting for him. He couldn't get his eye off the $80,000. He asked what it was doing there. I said, oh, I thought you might like to have that. I said, I'll sign this contract for $90,000, but if you want the $80,000, I'll pay you before you even start. What do you think he did? <laughs> Save $20,000 overnight. Learn to negotiate. Maybe before I leave, I'll give you the 21 principles of negotiation. You make money by negotiation. A lot of people don't realize that. But you see, you've got to come to grips with yourself. What has happened in our Christian work, I, I don't know how it crept in, but we've got a lot of passengers. We've got a lot of people that drive the pastor crazy all the time, asking him for information that they've asked him for the seventh or eighth time and he's given it to them, they're not doing it. Or they say, well, you don't understand, I've been rejected. Oh, for goodness sake, grow up. I rejected every woman in the world when I married my wife. There's a lot of rejected people around. 
oh, oh, you don't understand uh, how I was brought up. I wasn't brought up, I was dragged up. Well, uh, you know, I, I've had all these illnesses, you know. Hey, do you realize that Stephen Hawkins has the greatest mind since Newton and he's a quadriplegic and can't even speak? You see, we've got to come to grips with ourselves and that God is committed to our development. Dr. Alfred Adler, the great Austrian psychiatrist, understood this when he spoke of what he called the life lie of the neurotic. He said it is a categorical demand of the patient's life plan that he or she should fail through the guilt of others and thus be free from any responsibility. If I can blame what's happened to me on someone else or the system, then I'm free. I don't have to perform. And that's why we like the poverty mentality, because it means we don't have to perform. And if we don't perform, we don't earn. If we don't earn, we don't get. If we don't get, we cannot give. And the devil's won again. You know, the English psychologist, Dr. Hans J. Einzek, analyzed 19 reports covering 7,000 psychiatric cases, and he found a rate of cure or improvement with psychiatric help at 64%. He compared that to a spontaneous recovery rate. That is a rate of recovery for individuals who received no therapy at all, and that was 66%. Seems to me some of our psychiatrists might be driving us crazy. The Canadian psychiatrist, Dr. Raymond Price, spent 17 months studying Nigerian witch doctors and his conclusion was that they were about equal to those obtained in the North American clinics and hospitals. <laughs> so what about you? What if you feel as though you're too old? I hate being with people my own age. Why? Because they're always glorifying the past. It wasn't that good, I was there. <laughs> Oh, you've got some handicaps. Oh, let me tell you, you'll read it in my biography. I'm colorblind, and I sold more paint than anyone else in Australia. Absolutely colorblind. Ladies' fashions I used to sell. Colorblind. <laughs> and I couldn't write down the orders. I had to remember them because I couldn't write. You see, let me hasten to remind you that a hundred years of age, Grandma Moses is painting masterpieces, that a 94 Bertram Russell was active in national peace drives, that a 92 Rubenstein gave one of his greatest recitals in New York Carnegie Hall, that at 89 Albert Schweitzer was head of hospitals in Africa, that at 88 Conrad Adenauer was Chancellor of Germany, that at 82 Sir Winston Churchill wrote the history of the English-speaking people, at 46 Beethoven became totally deaf and he wrote his greatest music during those latter years in Orange County in California there's a man called Henry Viscani Jr. He was born without legs. He is the president of the Human Resource Center and founder of Abilities Incorporated with 13 honorary degrees and nine books to his credit. So my question is to you, what's your problem? Are you an excusiologist? For a number of years, I was chairman of the board of Youth for Christ Australia, 15 years. I was chairman of, uh, I, I was on the finance committee and world treasurer of Youth for Christ, co covering 114 countries. I know a little bit about young people. And you know what happens? You affirm your kids. Say, Jimmy, Mary, you can be anything you want to be. Mum and dad, we affirm you. We, we believe in you. You can do anything you want to do, but they look at you. They said, that's right, mum and dad, why didn't you do better? Why are you putting this heavy kick on me? And unfortunately, teenage boys in your country, in my country, we have the highest rate of suicide for teenage boys in the world. Not in Kosovo, not in Rwanda, in your country, in my country. Adults, you've got to get off your blessed assurance. You've got to start performing. Productivity is inseparably tied to purity. And some of you need to get rid of all that fear. People ask me, what do I see as a common denominator in Christendom throughout the world? It's fear, not faith. Fear. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You must be vulnerable before you can be viable. They say, well, I want to follow the crowd. Well, the Bible says, don't conform. Whatever happens, don't conform. Whatever happens, don't conform. Be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. William James was the greatest psychologist and behavioral scientist 
of the 20th century. And he said, the greatest discovery of my generation is you can change your life by changing your attitude. Edison said, greatness is an ordinary man or woman with an extraordinary attitude. I think my Bible's got it better. It says, you can be born again. You can change completely. And God is committed to our development. You see, for too long we have accepted our lot in life as an obedient drudgery. For too long we have listened to the theorists who walk us through the fog of doubt. For too long we have met at the table of maintenance seekers and sat hungry at their table. For too long we have sought direction from boneless wonders who may wear masks of piety and feign deep beliefs and yet keep our souls unsatisfied. It's time for us to win again. We are heading towards one of the biggest financial collapses in the history of civilization. We've got time. You've got a window of about 10 or 11 years. In this period, you can take back the economics. And the first principle of success is mastery over procrastination. Mastery over procrastination. If you was to come with me when I get in my motor car and go to my office, you'll hear me say a hundred times under my breath, do it now, 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 and, and build up the affirmation. There are people here in this church, and I don't have to be a genius to know this, there are people in this church that have been procrastinating for decades. There are others that have been procrastinating for years or months or weeks. Do something. Break with the past. Start to perform. You know, my wife is with me. Uh, she travels everywhere with me around the world. People say, do you take your wife everywhere? It's cheaper than alimony. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, we were in Western Australia some years ago, and I had to speak to a men's group. And... Uh, um, I said, oh, well, sweetheart, uh, they're coming for me at 9 o'clock. I'll be back at 5. What are you going to do? She said, well, I'm going shopping. Oh, my goodness. Now, it was many years ago. We were doing well, but not as well off as what we are today. I said, what, what, are, you, what are you going shopping for? She said, I'm going to buy a dress. I said, what do you need a dress for, for crying out loud? She said, Peter, it's our eldest son's wedding. I need a new dress for the wedding. I said, one dress? She said, one dress. We even kissed on it. <laughs> I came back that night at five o'clock and knocked on the door of the hotel. She opened it with flourish. I smelled a rat immediately. <laughs> As she held me in her arms, I saw two boxes on the bed. I said, hey, I thought we had a deal here. She said, now hang on. There's an interesting story about this. She said, after you left in the morning, I went down the main street. I saw a dress in the window that's perfect for Peter's junior wedding. I went and tried it on, fitted beautifully. They had a sign, no credits and no return. I bought it, there it is. I said, what about the other one? She said, don't rush me, I'm coming to that. She said, what am I supposed to do? It was 10.30 in the morning. You're not coming back till five o'clock at night. You're throwing yourself off the platform all over the city. She said, so I caught a bus and I went to Fremantle. Now that's where they took the America's Cup from you. You didn't know you had it until we took it. And. Uh, she found herself in a shopping mall. She said it was wonderful. I walked up and down. There was pipe music coming through the amplification system. I had some morning tea. She said, but suddenly I was arrested by another dress shop. When I looked in the window, I saw one better than the other one. She said, I knew we'd made a commitment, but I could hear this music coming through the amplification system. She said, and suddenly, as if by magic, I thought I heard your voice. I said, what did it say? She said, it said, mastery of over procrastination. Do it now. And I did. <laughs> the single most important tool for success. The second principle of success is enthusiasm. It comes from two Greek words, entheo, meaning the God within. In my international headquarters, I have a sign behind my desk that says either get enthusiastic within 10 seconds or get out. You see, enthusiasm is the outflowing of a pleasing personality and a contagious enjoyment for what you're doing. Enthusiasm is not void of reason, it's clarity of plans and energy with wings. The third principle is to develop habit force. Mankind are creatures of habit. 
You do things automatically by habit. And if you're going to change a habit, you must not break that within the first 90 days, otherwise you'll keep breaking it for the rest of your life. You see, you must never ever let an exception occur because once a habit is formed, it is difficult to break. So why not consciously create new habits, good habits, productive habits, and never let an exception occur? Principle number four, develop a positive mental attitude. The Bible says whatever things are good report, think on these things. The man that developed the Instamatic camera said, whenever I get a good idea, I inculate myself from negative thinking people. I only need one negative comment to destroy a good idea. You see, a positive mental attitude means spending your creative energies on finding ways things can be done rather than exhausting your emotional and mental powers dwelling on the ways that things cannot be done. It means turning a problem into a solution. It means you must develop thought displacement, stand sentinel at the gate of your mind and challenge thoughts as they come in. Principle number five, pay the full price. So many people start off on success and they start off by making a verbal commitment. And then they default in their periodical and final payments. Success is a price, a payment. Paying the full price means a commitment to excellence and learning how to excel in dimensions we have never known before in our lives. And whatever God has given you to do, you must know your stuff inside and out. Saturate yourself with it. There is nothing that will put a spring of confidence in your walk and in your performance like being sure that you definitely, concretely, and specifically know what you're doing. Principle number six, learn to speak on your feet. If you're going to build a corporation, there's going to be a time when you're going to have to address either a large staff or customers or people to persuade them that you want to get something done. Let me give you my own experience. If I had to speak to you years ago, I would have woken up at two o'clock this morning and run a mile at two o'clock, a mile at three o'clock, a mile at four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock to burn off the nerves. And then I'd run backwards and forwards to the toilet for the rest of the day. But a half hour before I left home to go and speak, my wife would get a large glass, half fill it with milk, put in three tablespoons of uh, burnt flour, three spoons of sugar and mix up a glue. And I would glug, glug, glug that glue down and that would buy my bowels so I wouldn't have an accident when I stood up and I got up to speak. I did that for 15 years. And every time I got home after speaking, I took four laxettes to get it all back to normal again. <laughs> you see, the pastor asks you to do something. You say, well, pastor, that's not my gifting. It's got nothing to do with your gifting. It's got to do with your commitment to Jesus Christ. You can if you think you can. Well, I wonder should I just break it up a bit now and just shake you up a little bit. You know, uh, you know, one of the ways past her to get rid of a lot of tapes, you want to see something happen now? You're going to move some tapes now. You watch this. I'll give you the 21 principles of negotiating a deal. One, what am I trading? Two, what am I forfeiting? Three, what are the uncertainties? Four, what are the guarantees of penalties? Five, what is the term? Six, what could cause failure? Seven, can I fully perform? Eight, can they fully perform? Nine, what are the buffer zones? Ten, what if we underestimate? Eleven, what if we overestimate? Twelve, can cost expand? Thirteen, can percentages increase? Fourteen, are there any exit points? 15, are there any conditions of mutual withdrawal? 16, are there any outside influences? 17, who exactly is in charge? 18, what are the ongoing obligations? 19, are there any upper or lower limits? 20, are the personalities involved permanently committed? 21, are all points of concern agreed, written, dated, signed and witnessed? I don't know whether you realise but that's worth at least five million dollars what I just gave you then. If you're too lousy to buy the tape, you deserve to fail. Now I did that deliberately and later on I'll do something else deliberately 
Maybe I'll do it now. Do you want to be able to go to a bank so that they'll always give you what you want? You need to understand banks. When a bank tells you I'm here to help you, that's the first lie they tell you. <laughs> They're there to help the bank. They need to do 12 things before you go there. One, show them the size of the market that you're after. Two, the size of your target market. Three, the method of marketing. Four, the quality of the competition. Five, the gross net and variable of costs. Six, the estimated timing of events. Seven, the in-house management procedures. Eight, the profits anticipated. Nine, your relative proven past experience. Ten, your exit options. Eleven, your limiting factors. And twelve, the cash required. Now, let me tell you, if you do that properly, you will get a loan every single time, provided it's sensible and it's got some balance. Let me move on. Maybe I'll do something and show you how to buy a franchise and, and maybe how to, uh, how to avoid legal confrontation. In 44 years of business, we've never been sued and we've never sued it. Think about that. Think of the stress that that's, that's, that's preventing, you see, because when you go to law, it's a contest, that's all it is. And the one that can produce the most believable evidence and pay for the highest lawyer wins the contest. Get out of it. You don't want to be in that. Let's move on. Seven, emotion. What happens when Christians go into business and things go wrong and the wheels fall off? They get emotional. And they say stupid things that hang around like a 40-year mortgage. Put your hands over your mouth. Learn to handle your emotion. The person that you've just insulted, the person that you've just accused of doing something which you may be wrong, you may need them in 12 months, 2 years, 5 years or 20 years time. You see, I think it's Voltaire that said, emotion is the enemy of reason. Emotion will always close a door. And emotion is not always subject to reason, but it's always subject to action. And action is the key word. If you get emotional, go for a run around the block. Stack up some books. Hit a punching bag. Principle number eight, learn to handle criticism. Many years ago, I fought pornography. First time for 300 years in the British Empire. I stopped them from using women as pornographic objects. I took it to the Supreme Court. Had the biggest march for family life in Australia's history. Put six people in Parliament. It was an incredible effort. And, uh, but uh, the comics of the country, everyone had a joke on me. I uh, had to have police protection because I was clo closing down porn shops. And I remember one day I was going in to close down a porn shop and the, uh, the television lay on the ground, the man with the camera, and took this long shot of me. They played it back at 6 o'clock news and it made me look 10 feet tall as I walked in. They did it in slow motion. They had Frankie Lane singing in the background, High Noon. And uh, <coughs> I did 213 debates that year on good morals as good economics on radio and television at universities. One every one of them. And my friend said, people are saying things about you, Peter, that are not true. They said they're, they're spitting on you. They're, they're, they're doing all sorts of things. Uh, uh, all this criticism, it must be crushing you. We're going to put a wall around you. I said, oh, fellas, back off. They said, but how? Uh, you mustn't be able to sleep. This terrible criticism, the things that they're saying. I said, fellas, you need to understand criticism has no power. The only power that criticism has is that which you give it while you're tossing and turning and trying to work out what that person said or what you thought they meant by what they said, you are giving criticism the power drive to destroy your life. I like what Mark Twain says about criticism. He said, if there's any real power in criticism, the skunk would have been extinct long ago. <laughs> Principle number nine, the law of attraction. I wonder what would have happened if you hadn't seen me sitting down here and, and if I came out from the curtain and I hadn't had a bath for four years and my hair was hanging down and I had a beard with yesterday's breakfast on it and old hang shirt and some long nails and, uh, that, that were dirty and a pair of old jeans and, and a pair of sandals with dirty toenails and I was swinging some worry beads. I mean, how would you have received me? I mean, you are people that look upon the heart. <laughs> 
You'd have cancelled me out. Why? Because you don't get a second chance on a first impression. Clothes may not make the man, but boy, they sure do introduce him. It's called the law of attraction. Birds of a feather flock together, if you want the scientific meaning of that. Ornithological species of identical plumage tend to congregate in the closer proximity. <laughs> now make sure what you're doing, if you're in business, that you use the law of attraction, your voice, the way you present your products. And make sure that as a Bible-believing Christian, you realize that you are an ambassador for Christ. That the way you behave, the way you present yourself. I hear Christians say, well, it doesn't matter how I dress. They'll take me or leave me. They'll leave you. <laughs> well, I'm not sure the Bible says anything about, hey, you better read your Bible. It says to Aaron to give him fine robes, to give him dignity and honor. We need to get our act together. Now, I'm going to say something that my wife will be unhappy about, but I'm gone on Friday. <laughs> you know, psychologists tell us that people with dirty interiors of motor cars wear dirty underwear. <laughs> I'm going out in the parking lot after. We'll put some, we'll put some numbers out here tomorrow night. <laughs> Principle number 10, persistent. Persistence. My Bible says, having put your hand to the plow and looking back, you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. But you know what happened to us? You know, if, 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 if we're not sure about anything, we say, well, I'm waiting on God. And listen, he's in front. He's waiting for us. <laughs> I mean, oh, oh well, well, yes, well, God's closed the door. Hey, kick it down. There's nothing caprice in God, nature. He will not give you a dream without giving you the ability to fulfill that dream. Or, you know, I'm too honest to do business. Does that mean Abraham was dishonest? Think about it. Does that mean that Jesus' father was dishonest? He owned a carpentry shop. The man Peter the fisherman was dishonest? You see, we're, we're, we become excusiologists. Persistence. Persistence. Benjamin Disraeli said, Perseverance and tact are the two great qualities most valuable for all mankind who want to amount to something, but especially for those who want to step out of a crowd. The next one is worry. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale was one of my very dear friends. He's gone on to be with the Lord. He wrote the book, The Power of Positive Thinking, and he tells a wonderful story. He was walking down the streets in New York one day, and he bumped into someone. They looked at him. They said, you're, you're, you're Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. He said, that's right. You wrote the book, The Power of Positive Thinking. He said, correct. Oh, he said, this is my lucky day. He said, how's that? He said, well, he said, it's these worries, these problems that I've got. I've I got all these worries and problems. Dr. Peale, if you can help me, I'll be your friend for life. Dr. Peel said, well, it just so happens that a minister of the gospel, I've just been visiting with 150,000 people that have no problems at all. He said, take me to them. He said, the local cemetery. <laughs> and he went on to say the problems are a sign of life, and the more problems you've got, the more life you've got. If you haven't got any problems, kneel down alongside your bed and put your hand up to heaven and say, Lord, don't you trust me anymore. Give me some problems. One of my great friends, W. Clement Stone, who passed away in September last year at 100 years of age, who built the Combined Insurance Company of America, at the height of his power, he had 14 secretaries. And if someone said, oh, we've got a problem there, you'd hear his voice boom out. Problem? Problem? Bring it to me. Shut the doors. Shut the windows. Give it to me. It'll make me strong. Don't let the problem get away. Give it to me. Nobody take it. Young people, ask the older people, they'll tell you the problems they've had to overcome have taught them what they know today. See, what is worry? Worry is creating mental pictures of the things you do not want. That's anti-Bible. Decision making. You know, sometimes I'm chairman of the board of some Christian organizations and we have to make some very important decisions on evangelism for the whole world. We've sent out prayer letters and people have been praying for months, sometimes years. We've gathered up 
a certain amount of finance and we're ready to make a decision and we'll fly into Singapore or Chicago or London or Sydney or somewhere and the whole international board will be there and as chairman of the board I'll say well we've got to take a vote and as soon as those words leave my mouth some twit on the board says Mr. Chairman I've got a feeling in my spirit about this I tell him to go to the bathroom I mean we get these knotheads that when you're ready to make a decision they contribute absolutely nothing but indecision look I've seen more lives lost I've seen more marriages fail I've seen more churches collapse uh, not by not by bad decision but just by not making decisions you can correct something but you can't correct nothing my Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his way who can know him and we have proven scientifically that successful people make decisions quickly and change them rarely and unsuccessful people make decisions slowly and change them often. Don't let the dissenters to be the deciders. Well, I'm looking at that time and I'm, uh, I'm thinking of what else I should share with you. Maybe I, uh, maybe I should share something with you about running a business. Let me tell you, if you're going to run a business, you pick people that are already hard workers. Don't try and make them hard workers. Hire slowly, fire quickly. Don't feel bad about firing someone. You're doing them a favour because you're saying to them, this is not the level that is acceptable. And the rules of business are simply this, there are no rules. You make them up as you go along you are absolutely responsible. The only rule you have is not to go broke. You need to work on a, always on a basis of minimal debt. Keep sensible deadlines. Never kid yourself. Check your emotions regularly. And never surrender your authority. And don't believe everything you're told. And if suppliers make mistakes, make them pay for it. Don't you pay for it because that's going to come right out of your profits. You must make a profit. Read the story of the talents. I had my research team chase up what a talent was in Jesus' time. There were two talents. There was the standard talent and the royal talent. The standard talent was 30 kilos of gold. The royal talent was 60 kilos of gold. So what was Jesus talking about? He was talking about an awful lot of money. Well, I just don't know how far to take this, but let me, let, me, let, me do so. let me ask you a question first before I go any further. One of the corporations I own is called the World Center of Entrepreneurial Studies. It's become quite famous. We don't have a campus. We're quite different than a university. A university says, you come to where we are in the time frame that we tell you and we'll teach you what we think you ought to know. We go anywhere in the world where we're invited in the time frame that they have available we'll teach them what they want to know. I've been to New York with people with three degrees and they can't run a business. You see, by the time they get the information on business and they sort out what they want to teach and they put it in written form, get it into a curriculum, then get it printed, and then the professors can learn it and by the time they teach the students and by the time they have the exam, it's useless. We go anywhere in the world, we're invited. Nelson Mandela has asked us to come and, uh, and help reconstruct South Africa. North Korea, one of your enemies, has asked us to come and set up a free trade zone. We get invited all around the world and we get results. Now I have some of the material that I've sent here in advance. Would you like me to show you what I've brought here? Are you interested? Don't overwhelm me with your enthusiasm, will you? Are you interested or not? Okay. Uh, I wonder would someone go out with my wife and, uh, and uh, get some material for me and bring it in. And let me tell you, oh, magic. Can you believe this? You know, you just, you just messed the whole thing up. I was going to ask and see if anyone had any questions. Anyone have, have a business question they want to land on me right now? It's very easy for me. I'm. Uh, where is it? Can I?
Can I see someone? Stand up. If you yes, call out, sir. Yes. Right, the comment was, I said we had about 11 years before a major collapse. Would I like to elaborate on it? If you want me to, I will. Are you interested? Yes. Okay, well, America owes six trillion, if you can believe your politician. Now, we have a saying in Australia, how do you know if your politician is lying? His lips are moving. <laughs> now, uh, you're told you owe six trillion. If you owe six trillion, and you started paying it back at a dollar a second and you haven't been able to pay one dollar back in the last 20 years but if you started a dollar a second and you started 150 years ago you have to go 159,000 years to pay your bills that's if you owe six trillion our research team and we have our own research team say it's 17 trillion also, you do not own your own currency. The Federal Reserve is a private cartel and has never had an audit. You'll notice also that the European Union, uh, the uh, euro dollar, is starting to, uh, to, to push you off the perch. Also, they're starting to back their currency with gold. Japan owns 25% of the uh, American bonds and they're holding America to ransom at the moment that if America doesn't rescue their banks then they'll sell up the bonds. What do you think is going to happen to the Dow? See, your, your Dow has to go down to 4,000 before it reaches reality. Uh, we're closer than what you think. America is burdened with debt and you're scaring the life out of the rest of the Western world. Why? Because we don't want anyone but America to lead the world. Now I've spoken with some of your politicians and I've suggested that you start at Alaska and don't go down to Chile. That you form the United Americas. Because down there you've got 400 million people who needed the standard of living lifted. You've got more oil, more bauxite, more gold, more diamond, more uh, silver, more lumber, more arable land, more water than anywhere else on the face of the earth. You've got people there that want the standard of living lifted. Why don't you go down there now while they're in distress and change their currency onto the dollar even if you have to offer them anything and then you can do a locomotive from Alaska down to Chile you won't violate any airspace you won't violate any shipping lanes and you'll have the opportunity of building a missile base from the South Pole to the North Pole and you can keep the world free for 500 years because Germany is not going to allow you to get in to Europe and Japan and China, who are now talking about forming an allegiance, won't allow you to get into Asia. With all the goodness you've done to these people, you've blessed them. Read about King Amaziah. Read about when he was going to get the Israelites, to, the people of Israel, to help him fight a battle. He had already paid and blessed them and helped them. And the man of God said, God can give you much more than this. Leave them alone. Forget all your allegiances to them. I think America is the only benevolent country in history and I've studied history for 44 years I've read uh, 6,500 biographies I believe that America needs to get its act together economically and that's why it's going to happen if they don't any other question yes stand up someone will come to you with a microphone how many years um, should a company have under its belt before it franchises uh, it's not a matter of years for a company to franchise and maybe I could uh, uh, maybe tomorrow night maybe I can give you the uh, the rules of how to how to franchise but uh, it's whether or not the organization that they have built is profitable and franchisable can you cookie cut it you see now you've got to be able to produce something that is uh, profitable and easy to cookie cut now, if you can do that, then you can bring someone in, show them what you've got, show them how you've picked your, your location, uh, show them what sort of training program you've got, and help them get into the next one. Once you've got two, uh, the rest is pretty easy, because then you can, you can show two. Two to show that successful is better than one, three is better. And once you do that, uh, but remember that every success and every failure has a limited time frame. Any other questions? Based on the principle of franchising, what do you suggest would be the cutoff time to keep a prospect in line of sight for network marketing? 
network marketing. Network marketing is an artificial love machine. Uh, I wrote a book with my son called A Global Survey into, ne uh, into Multi-Level Marketing with a, su with a subheading, The Rescue of an Industry. Network marketing is a good uh, marketing strategy, but there's a lot of scams out there and they go through the church like a laxette. Uh, I've uh, written a thing that uh, you'll be able to uh, get from us uh, called How to Choose a Multi-Level Marketing Company Without Destroying Your Family or Your Church. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, I wasn't intending to do this, Patrick. Is this all right? Yes, sir. Yes, how do you go about getting uh, financial backing for uh, an idea that you have? Pick a button. How do you go about getting a, a financial backing for an idea that you have? Well, the question, sir, is whether the idea is practical. You see, a lot of people have ideas, but they've never done anything that shows that people should trust them or should back them. You see, if you don't have a history of good management of your own personal life, no one's going to back it. Uh, I don't suggest that you borrow money. We don't, we don't have a loan or mortgage anywhere in the world. We have uh, capital reserves, but we don't get involved in other uh, corporations. I'm building uh, uh, seven deep for my heritage, for my families. I want to go seven deep. But what you could do, if you think it's that good, why don't you uh, get, uh, I don't know how much you need, but say you need $100,000, why don't you get five people to invest uh, $20,000 each and give them a part of the action, and give them uh, at least 40% of the business. That means you've got another 9% that you can negotiate with if you need some more money later, and by then it's tripling along a little bit and you can up the rate a little bit, okay? It means you've got nothing to pay back then, okay? You pay back with profits. Anyone else? Yes. Yes. I have a question for you. What happens when you have aspirations of owning a business, but unfortunately you may not have a trade that you're good at, but you're, you're good at actually on the, the consulting side of the business, but not sure how to pursue which avenue, which, in, which industry to get involved in? How do you focus exactly on your strength? Well, you know, I don't want to be indelicate, but I'm Australian. Consultants are like uh, castrated bulls. All they can do is advise. <coughs> You see, you've got to learn to sell. The selling business is the highest paid profession in the world. Learn to sell on commission because commission is set for mediocrity and any fool can beat mediocrity. But most Christians won't do that. They want to w work under the umbrella of security. And uh, you don't win under security. Yes, ma'am. You told me about five years ago that commission sales was the way yeah. to make the most money be profitable for ourselves and for the kingdom of God. I have successfully paid off my husband's debts after 10 years that way. What's your question? My question is, what are the three areas in business in the world where straight commission sales is going to make me the most money? Money, real estate, and automobiles. Any other question? This is... Oops. Setting prices for products, I mean, should you base it on what the market is or on what you feel the value is? The market sets the value of a product. You see, uh, uh, I, I'm a qualified valuer. And uh, if you're facing uh, value in a court, is the highest, best permitted use. And they say to get value as an anxious but not too anxious, uh, no, a willing but not too anxious buyer and a willing but not too anxious seller, that's how you get value. Now that's a theoretical way of doing it, and theory is the language of the scholar, but pragmatism is the language of the doer. And uh, so you put your product up to the highest price the market will take, okay? And uh, if uh, someone undercuts you, you know that you're too high and it's hard to get that market back again. Now, it's a fallacy to think that prices, uh, that if you make your, your, your product cheap, it's going to sell. No, it's not going to sell. Uh, it's the marketing that sells, and it's the marketing that's the most expensive side of business, quality and all that being equal. So uh, uh, there's, there's no way that you can say, well, uh, here, here is something that cost me uh, $50. I have to allow a $40 margin for the... Uh, uh, for the shopkeeper, I'll put a $20 margin for me. It may not be worth $110 to the buyer. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it may be worth $600 to the buyer. 
Okay, so the market determines the value of the product, and uh, uh, you uh, you've got it. The 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 higher value product you get, the bigger percentage there is for you, unless it's a fast turnover. Okay. Yes. I started a business uh, this week, sole proprietorship, and um, I'm going to be selling a, a product, and I'm not sure if I should incorporate, and um, or do a L. LC. Okay, do a limited liability company and isolate all your assets in a family trust. Okay, there's a lot of financial scalpers in America suing in sport. Any other quick questions and I'll stop. Is that the end of it? Okay, we might see if we can do another one uh, tomorrow night if you'd like to do that, get your questions ready and we'll, we'll spend a uh, little bit of time doing that. Um, now I've got some of these books out here, let me tell you uh, don't spend money you cannot afford. Uh, learn the pain of going without. But if you can, spend money on your brains. It's the only thing that they can't take from you. The first book I wrote was called How to Be Happy Though Rich. It talks about how to give. It also talks about how to get. It also gives you some of the formulas because I've never been through formal schooling and I don't read the same way as you do. I read eight books at a time. Uh, and because I've never gone through the traditional way and I have acute dyslexia, I can get lost in a hotel lobby, uh, I have some other gifts. And one of them is that I can put formulas together that work 100% of the time. Let me give you one of the formulas in here that will pull your life together in a hurry. Uh, ask yourself four questions. Question number one, what age have you set yourself to reach your full potential that God might maximize your life? Question number two, could you tell me in 50 pages or more what your full potential is in every area of your life? Question number three, accepting your full potential to 100%, what percentage rating would you give yourself right now? Question number four, accepting the deficiency between the two scores, what plans are you going to make to take up the shortfall and when? It'll get your act together. And also, uh, shows you how I measure every day. I rarely work more than five hours a day and maybe one or two days a week. I can make enough money on that. I, I don't have any problems because I have a mathematical formula for measuring every day. If I was to ask you what sort of a day you had, you'd say I had a good day, a great day, a terrible day, but that's like the state of your digestion. I measure it on profits. When I wrote this book, it was on the third page of every newspaper in the whole of Australia, and the, uh, the national government put on a prime time television program on a day in the life of Peter Daniels. The second book I wrote was called How to Reach Your Life Goals, which qualifies for the New York Times bestseller list, but they can't give me the recognition because we do not sell through bookshops. I wondered what would happen with this, but it went, I didn't launch it even, didn't even do a launch. Somehow it was discovered and uh, it got on the front page of one of the biggest newspapers in Australia and took war off the front page. It says the first time in the history of literature uh, that uh, the medical profession have come together and they've asked for a book to go on cassette tape to reprogram damaged brains. We get thousands of letters from around the world on this one. One that uh, goes with it is this one here called uh, uh, how to be motivated all the time. We have proven scientifically that if you get a person that's 60 years and even 70 years of age that sets a long-term goal, puts their heart, their soul, their money, mind, their spirit in it, it will actually reprogram their body clock. Don't read this going to bed, you'll never get to sleep. Um, uh, it's a formula that works, we've never had a failure on it. It works 100% of the time. This one's how to handle a major crisis. It'll show you how to handle a crisis and put it into segments so that you can control it rather than having it, it control you. It saved more lives than anything else we've ever done and I'm going to write a book on it and call Those Who Were Rescued because it, it's just saved so many lives. The uh, next one, and a lady tonight came to me out in the foyer and said she got this book some uh, years ago called How to Have the Awesome Power of Public Speaking. 
I went on one tour of the United States and Canada and we outsold every speaker in the whole of the United States, as a matter of fact, North America. Uh, but I, uh, this is not what I do, I'm in business and uh, I speak occasionally, so you might find that helpful. Remember I spoke to you uh, I, about this teacher, Miss Phillips used to punch me, kick me, slap me, get me by the chin, rat my teeth, say, Peter Daniel, you're a bad, bad boy and never amount to anything. This book is called Miss Phillips. You were wrong. <laughs> it's a, you see, people see you as you are now. They have no idea how far you can go. IQ tests tell you where you are now. It doesn't say how far you could go. The most unlikely person in this church tonight could literally change the world. If I could get you agile, mobile, and hostile, if I can get you where you're prepared to trade your life, because finally, finally, when you do expire, whatever you've done in your lifetime, that's what you've traded your life for. And the cost of a big dream, a small dream, or no dream at all, it's still going to cost you your life. Uh, now, uh, you remember in Columbine and San Diego when they had the problems, this is the one that the, the kids got. Uh, it was meant for adults because it's to handle rejection, but 10, 11, 12 year old kids absolutely love it. They say it's a cool book. And uh, even one of them said it was wicked. Now today that means good. Uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, so uh, you might... Uh, yeah, people ask about Miss Phillips. They say, what happened to Miss Phillips? Did she ever find out? No, as a matter of fact, uh, I found out when she died, they buried her 60 feet in the ground. Because <laughs> deep down, she's a real nice person. <clears throat> now, let me tell you, this is the second place in the whole world that has this. I only got, what did we get, two boxes or three boxes? Two boxes, that's all I've got here. We've got some more back at Australia, but Australia has not launched this book. Uh, last Wednesday night, we had the Consulate General of Australia in Los Angeles helping with the launch of it. And it's my biography that people have been asking for for 20 years now. It takes you right from before I was born, where we came from and so on, up to my 70th birthday. And it's got some funny pictures in there. You'll see me laying bricks and, and uh, doing all sorts of things. It's called Living on the Edge. And uh, it uh, shows you the struggles I had, some of the triumphs, some of the failures, uh, uh, that people said that this guy's a religious nut. And uh, uh, one, uh, when I, the second job I got, uh, selling when I couldn't even write out the orders they said he's a religious nut but I topped the whole nation for 22 months every month in uh, monetary value in uh, square footage in new customers and so on and so they grounded me for three weeks so that I couldn't compete anymore and gave me uh, to give the other salespeople a chance and they gave me a raise they said now we're giving you a, a raise we're going to increase your salary uh, considerably but you mustn't tell the other salesman about it I said that's all right I'm as ashamed about it as you are and uh, <laughs> and then straight from there I went into my own business but uh, uh, that's uh, it also has the newspaper clippings on inside of uh, each cover and so on you might find that interesting um, the other thing we did and we only did 2,000 for the whole world uh, this uh, is uh, Living on the Edge, and we did a special edition of the book uh, with, that is numbered and gold leaf on the edge, and I did three DVDs showing my life in film uh, all the way, and television coverage, and uh, showing me getting the uh, ceremonial sword from the United States Marines, and all sorts of things, and a CD when I did the debates on, uh, on uh, morality. And uh, I uh, used to go to universities with a big Thompson chain reference Bible and just uh, debate with all the hippies and they were on one subject, good morals is good economics. Now, uh, we only have three of these here. I understand, I rang the office today and a shipment's coming in today at the office, uh, but we only have 2,000 numbered with a, a registration on them for the entire world. And you might be interested in that. About 12 years ago, I've been close to 14 years ago now, uh, my country asked me if I would do uh, something that would help people to become successful. So I did a three-part tutorial called Destiny, 
show them how to do an analytical study on their life, look for their strengths and weaknesses, then show them how to use their imagination because the imagination is far more powerful than the will and then show them how to set goals for their entire life. And that's what I'm gonna speak about tomorrow night. I'm gonna get two men and two women out of the audience, bring you up here, and from a biblical perspective, show you how to reach your life goals and hit it on target. I've done this uh, right across the world a thousand times. Matter of fact, one time here I did it in the United States to 31,000 chief executive officers, and it went off the planet. And I stopped doing that for some time and I got uh, from when I was here last I got very ill and uh, and it looked like I was going to expire and my wife came to me she said Peter all the formulas you've got all the things you've created everything that you've learnt if you go home to be with the Lord it's gone she said I want you to work on it I want you to get every formula out dust it off I want you to put it in sequence for our grandchildren as part of their heritage I said, oh, sweetheart, you don't know what you're asking. It's like going to Mount Everest and taking your family for a picnic. Uh, but she kept at it. She said, I'll pray that God will preserve you. And I finished it. I would never have done it under any other conditions. And uh, I completed the whole thing, and then I got well again. And uh, I launched it in America just a few years ago, and it's called, it's, it's now recognized as the most comprehensive success program in the last hundred years. It's called Destiny of the Third Millennium. All the stuff that you've seen here, it has all of that in except my biography, but it has 400% more material than I've ever uh, shown people before. Let me give you some idea of the capacity of it, and please don't spend money you cannot afford, but uh, give you some idea of the capacity of it. There's a formula to mathematically measure daily performance, a formula of how to use your imagination, a totally new science in imagination. There's uh, the principles of negotiation, a formula to evaluate your present position, your strengths and weakness. It's a, a formula to have special distinctives for your life. Ten principles of how to build better people. Ten principles looking after your greatest assets. A full program that we used to sell for $400 on how to get more done and have time left over. There's 12 unbreakable laws of success. A full program with charts on goal setting at all levels to last a lifetime. A formula on creating a mission statement because a mission is the ethics and the mechanics of the journey. 17 principles of time management. A question formula to stimulate greatness. Six general laws of contract contract, 25 principles of understanding the essentials of leadership, 7 principles on handling law and con conflict, 10 principles for economic protection, how to start a business, 7 principles to develop an idea, that's what that man asked for over there, 12 principles for identifying power holders, 12 essentials on creating a business plan, a formula of how to the power of discipline, 18 secrets in running a business, a formula to have supreme confidence for every occasion, 10 principles in understanding advertising, 7 keys to selling, 12 laws in buying a franchise, 18 keys of running a business, a flow chart uh, for your progress and so on and so forth, there's more and more. And anyone that gets that is locked into the World Center of Entrepreneurial Studies for life. Which means if they ever have a business problem, they can contact us for the rest of their life and free of charge we use our research team to get you out of that problem. And it's a very serious way we do that. And we've helped people all these years. It's divided into six areas. The dream, the sense of grandeur towards life. And in every church we've got people who run around and they've got a different dream every month. We laugh at them because nothing ever happens. But you see, they've got a sense of grandeur towards life. God's knocking on the door. They need to read Ecclesiastes, which says, For a dream comes through much activity. Get busy. And a fool's voice is known by his many words. Nothing will happen until you take it to the vision. You've got to put some arms and legs on it, get some structure. The vision is the depth, capacity, and measurable impact of a dream. That's why Job said, Then you scare me with your dreams, but you terrify me with your vision. But then it won't happen until you make the commitment, the acceptance of pain as a cost towards a benefit. That's why Timothy said, you therefore must endure pain as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. But then you've got to set the goal, the dedication to think, plan, meditate and learn. That's why Paul said, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in God, in Christ Jesus. 
then you've got to set the mission, which is the ethics and mechanics of the journey. The mission is the purity, forbearance and fearlessness of character. That's why Habakkuk said, write the vision, make it on plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. And then you reach your destiny, the imperative to exchange a life for a moral cause that will endure. That's why in Romans he said he predestined these he called. Now I'm looking at the clock, that's more than enough. I think I was going to hit the whiteboard, but uh, I probably would have confused you and given you all sorts of mathematical figures and uh, you wouldn't have got any sleep at all tonight. But tomorrow night we're going to really, you better bring your seatbelt. We're going to get things moving. We're going to have question time, but we're going to get four people, set their life goals for them from a biblical perspective and show them how to hit it on target and it's going to be very, very different. The man that brought these up, I wonder whether he'd be kind enough to take that back, and I'll pass you back to the pastor. God bless you.